أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحبون وما تنفقوا من شيء فإن الله به عليم كل الطعام كان حلا لبني إسرائيل إلا ما حرم إسرائيل على نفسه إلا ما حرم إسرائيل على نفسه من قبل أن تنزل التوراة قل فأتوا بالتوراة فاتلوها إن كنتم صادقين فمن افترى على الله الكذب من بعد ذلك فأولئك هم الظالمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has allowed us to complete three juz of the Qur'an in this summarized commentary and tafsir. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq of the rest. So today we begin the fourth juz. Now the fourth juz has the ending of Surah Ali Imran. About three quarter of the juz is uh, dedicated to the ending of Surah Ali Imran and then it begins with about one quarter, the last quarter, is Surah An-Nisa, the chapter on women. The main themes that we're going to be looking at today that this just covers is number one, a huge discussion on unity. And then a discussion on spending in the path of Allah. So spending in the path of Allah, that comes back. And also that's reiterated. And then concept of unity and holding fast to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very important point. Then after that, there's several other points about the virtues of this ummah. Virtues of this ummah uh, in terms of uh, being the best of ummah in terms of Amr al-Ma'roof, Nahi anil munkar which we'll look at. And then quite a, quite a lot of uh, discussion towards the end to finish off the chapter. Uh, the discussion is about the battle of Badr and then more so about the battle of Uhud. And then also adding on to that another small expedition that took place. And the numerous lessons to be learned from that. And then a huge discussion about the munafiqeen and so on. And then of course we begin Surah An-Nisa. And in there, there, there are laws, again very specific laws about women, children, inheritance and so on. So inshallah that's what we're looking at today. So in the name of Allah we begin. So in Surah Ali Imran. There was a huge discussion yesterday as we covered مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ إِنْفَاقْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Spending in the path of Allah. Very important aspect. Again here, this is reiterated. It comes back. It's reiterated in the following words. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ Right at the beginning. حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ An additional step. You cannot attain to piety. Like if you really want to show your piety to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to really be considered among the righteous and pious ones and the obedient ones, then you must then be able to spend and be prepared to spend of that which you love. So even things that your, your most choicest uh, possession, uh, 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 something that you own, you love it a lot. It's something you use all the time. It's the pen that I use all the time. But somebody wants it. You give it to them. It's a shawl, it's a shawl, it's a jacket, it's uh, something else, a book. And somebody really wants it, not somebody who's taken advantage of you, then you're willing to give it. Because the only way you'd be able to do that is that your love for Allah and love for piety will overwhelm the love of that object. Knowing that Allah will give me back so much more anyway. But if I'm giving this for Allah, then I get piety. So that's mentioned here. Then the discussion begins with... Uh, so that's a sacrifice we're talking about. Then it speaks about how uh, the Bani Israel and how Yaqub alayhi salam had certain things that were uh, made prohibited at that time and, uh, uh, and, and there's a challenge to the Bani Israel in this regard. But to move on, what happened is as we read uh, yesterday, the Qibla was changed from Masjid al-Aqsa to Masjid al-Haram. 
And there was quite a bit of discussion and quite a bit of objection to that and uh, a, a, lot, a lot of discussion, uh, discussion as, we, as we mentioned yesterday. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again reiterates this point here. Now what had happened is that one of the contentions or one of the challenges was that why change to Kaaba, the, uh, the Baytullah in Makkah Mukarramah, when Masjid al-Aqsa is the first house of Allah on the earth. Now Masjid al-Aqsa is one of the earliest houses. I think it was constructed about 40 or 50 years after the Masjid al-Haram, uh, the, uh, the Kaaba was constructed by the angels right at the beginning of Adam or the ancient angels. So yes, it is a very old house. And because of the, the famous story of Ibrahim salam raising, raising the foundations again, and that's seen as kind of the, 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 the moment from which the Kaaba has always been present. Because although the Kaaba was built before that, it had become destroyed and uh, the, the, it only the foundations had been left. So Ibrahim salam apparently renovated it from the foundation. So he's considered to be the renovator of the Kaaba from, the, from which, whose time until now there's, the Kaaba remains in building form. So maybe that was their misunderstanding. So they said that Baytul Maqdis is actually superior to the Kaaba. Right? It's Allah's first house on the earth. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies here that inna awwala baytin wudi'a nasi lalladhi bi bakkah Bakka is the old name of Mecca, it's another way of saying it. Mubarakan wa hudan lil alameen, the blessed house and the means of guidance for the people. So that is the first house that has been placed for people. That, that was formulated for people. So Kaaba is the first house. It's full of... Then a few other things that's mentioned. That not just that, but in that location there are several other things. Allah says, Fihi ayatun bayyinatun maqamu Ibrahim wa man dakhalahu kana amina and then, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ bayt. There are also some other very salient features of Islam. Some other very important like Safa and Marwa is there. Then you have the Zamzam which is there. Then you also have the Maqam of Ibrahim. So a lot of the remnants from the time of Ibrahim salam are there. <coughs> and they're satisfactorily authenticated to be in, in that same position. So that's why... That holds a greater position. This has got Zamzam, it's got the Hatim or the Hijr Ismail, right, which is the semicircular area which was supposed to be part of the Kaaba, and so on and so forth. Number three, it's a sanctuary. That's why nobody's allowed to be killed in there. It's a sanctified area, and whoever enters it, they are safe. And fourthly, one of the most important things is that there's no other place in the world that a Muslim, after they get a certain amount of money, or they attain a certain amount of means that they would be obligated to travel. Right? Unless you live in Mecca, obviously. From anywhere else around the world, when a Muslim gets maybe five, seven thousand pounds, right? Hajj becomes fard on them in the months of Hajj. It's the only place in the world that you would have to undertake this journey at least once in your lifetime. You don't have to go to Baytul Maqdis or Medina Munawwara for that matter, though there's huge benefit in going there as well. And you'll be actually rewarded for taking an exclusive journey to those areas. But the place where it's obligatory is Makkah Mukarramah, which is to the house of Allah to perform the Hajj at least once in your lifetime. There's no other place like that in the world for that. And it can't come to you. With anybody else, they could come to you, but with the Kaaba, it's there. So, this shows the Fadila. And then, of course, um, it's a special house built by Ibrahim alayhi salam with the assistance of his son Ismail alayhi salam and then you have Hajar alayhi salam her contribution there of the Zamzam well her running between Safa and Marwa which is pretty much the only thing in any of these revealed religions right any re religions of the book as such Christianity, Judaism, Islam it's the only right that relates to a woman which Islam has that Islam's got a right that every everybody does men and women that they have to go between Safa and Marwa, which is to basically revive what Hajar alayhi salam did. And then mashallah, with her efforts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's giving, we have the Zamzam as well. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells, talks to the believers. And in here, there's several different things. Uh, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about not being careful of your enemy, being careful of those who... Uh, are always out there to get you that they will turn you away from your faith as far as possible we see this and there's going to be a lot more of this discussion as we go along we see this all the time anybody who's trying to do somewhat good 
trying to talk about the truth and the reality, whether that regards world politics or anything like that, then you've got the, the media, especially certain Islamophobic media outlets, that will just jump on you, that will basically troll you, that will basically uh, provide numerous negative uh, editorials about the individual to try to put them off. That's why only the very brave will survive that kind of a thing. And that's where the, a lot of the himma and a lot of the energy and, and um, a lot of the encouragement is being provided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun which is verse 102. Allah is telling us that you must as much as is the right of Allah for to be feared you must fear Allah that much. That's huge. That's why uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu explains that. How do you fear Allah as much as is His right to be feared? Right? Haqqat taqwa as such. So, number one, you have to obey Him in as much as you can. And you do not do anything which He is prohibited. You remember Him, dhikr. You constantly remember Him in every one of your dealings. You're thinking about Him. You never forget Him. You thank Him for every good that comes to you. And there's a good coming to us, there's a good with us at every moment. Of course, it's very different. You never show ungratitude, ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then after that, you've got about three pages in which there's a recurring theme about the best ummah, the best community, the most virtuous community, the superior community. That's very interesting. This is... وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ وَالْمُفْلِحُونَ Because as it will be mentioned later, that is what makes you the best community. Which is that you should do Amr bil ma'roof, you should command the right, prohibit the evil wherever you see it, and you should invite towards goodness. And later on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٌ You are the superior community who has basically been appointed for the people to do these acts. So if a Muslim doesn't do them at any level, then they're not fulfilling their, their position, their role, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the believers as a whole to do that. That's why at some level or the other it must happen. When Amr bil ma'roof nahi nunga, commanding the right, like encouraging somebody in whatever way, shape or form, implicitly, explicitly, nicely with wisdom, right? Oh brother, look, this would be really nice if you do this in Ramadan. You know, mashallah, I've started doing this in Ramadan. I do a few tahajjud rakats at night at suhoor time. It'd be very good if you can do that as well, my sister. Right? Um, if somebody's doing wrong in a very nice way, in a way that will be effective, you tell them, look, this isn't appropriate. It's not good. Most people will benefit from a sincere advice. When you just imagine psychologically, if nobody tells you anything. So you've got no new input coming into you. And you've got nobody telling you whatever you're doing is discouraged even. So that means you, you stay stagnant, you can't improve. Especially the vast majority of people who just about, just about, I mean the few people that are listening here, and I say few, there may be hundreds who are listening right now, right? But it's only a few compared to the masses who don't listen to anything. Alhamdulillah, there's lots of uh, scholars doing good work. But there's some who... Even on Fridays, if they go for Friday prayer, they will run just to get the prayer. They'll miss the khutbah, right? They'll miss the lecture. So such people will never get any input. So whatever they, the few things that they may have or not have, they will continue like that for the rest of their life. Humans need progression all the time, right? This is called professional development. So this would be called religious development. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind because reminders are beneficial for the believers. So it's always important to listen. To listen. Because someday that will affect us. It will create a reminder. It will create a guilt feeling, some kind of remorse. And it will spur us and encourage us. That's why it's very, very important. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he, his remark about this whole uh, issue was, Whoever's, whoever wants in his heart that he then be considered to be part of this ummah, whoever has this heartfelt desire that they are considered ummah to al-Muslimin, ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then they should fulfill this condition of Allah. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nasi ta'muruna bil ma'roof, which is verse 110. So really think think over these verses. So these three characteristics that have been mentioned about this ummah 
right? They're very specific to this ummah. It's a khasiyah, as they say. It's a very particular characteristic of this ummah that you're supposed to do this. So our ummah is a proselytizing ummah. But with wisdom, as with the Prophet Sallallahu that he used to teach with hikmah. That's what's important. Militarily doing these things in the wrong way, right? You've got a family member who's not doing something right. And militarily, like, I mean, in a military fashion, you go, you know, with all guns blazing, like symbolically, I don't mean, I don't mean real guns, you go and you try to change it. That doesn't work most of the time. It doesn't work most of the time. So, the Prophet ﷺ said that by the one in whose hand is my life, basically by the one, the, the oath is taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying that you sometimes tell people to do good yourself, no, you must continue to tell people to do good and you must continue to tell people not uh, to, to stop doing bad. Right? You must continue to do that. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very likely and possible, as the hadith says in Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, it's very likely that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send upon you a really bad punishment. And after that, even if you pray, make dua and invoke Allah, your duas will not be accepted. So, this idea of commanding the right and prohibiting the wrong in, you know, in, in the right way, this is actually linked to du'as being accepted. If you want your du'as to be accepted, do a bit of a ma'ruf and nahi al-munkar. If you don't, then a punishment will come and you will not get any benefit. You will, your du'as will no longer be accepted. That's a very important link that the Prophet ﷺ is making there. After that, it carries on because there was a constant turmoil with the munafiqeen, the hypocrites in Medina Munawwar, it was a constant challenge that was, they were the irritants for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslimin. So, there's a discussion about them now, right? And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that, do not make such people who, have, who harbor evil to you, you know they're clearly evil, right? Who don't have any good in for you, you do not make them your friends. So, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tattakhidhu bitanatan min dunikum. From out, from beyond your circle, you make those people bitana. Bitana is like the inner lining. You make them so close to you. And subhanallah, if you do a, if you do a cursory study, even a cursory study of history, because right? sometimes in contemporary issues, it's very difficult to tell because you're in the thick of things and you're in the woods as such. But when you look at history, literally, whatever is happening today or any given time is just a cycle of history. Just same old thing. And you'll see that one of the biggest downfalls for any Muslim group throughout our history has most of the time been that where they've been split up and divided and promised support by an enemy where the enemy provides is, is showing support for one side over another, making them fight. And that side thinks that they're getting something out of this. Most of the time it's because of ego. It's because of trying to get the one above the other. Right? Uh, a lot of the time it's a complete deception in the thing that they're doing it for Islam because they think they've got the better Islam or they're in a better position to rule. You look through the Seljuk time, you, you, you look at the Mamluks time, you look uh, at the Ottoman time. Constantly this was, this was the problem. And we still don't learn from it today. Right? We still don't learn. We don't see the deception of shaitan and this, the deception of the enemies, that they, what they really seek to do. The Tatars, the, the, the Mongols did that. Pretty much every group, this, is, this was what was happening. So that's something very important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides three reasons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides three reasons here, here why you shouldn't take such people as your uh, as your very close associate, close friends and advisors and so on, is because number one, they لا يألونكم خبال They don't care for you anyway. وَدُّوا مَا عَنِتُمْ They would love that you actually be troubled and dis destroyed. And قَدْ بَرَتِ الْبَغْضَاءُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِمْ In many cases, you can actually see the enmity, the hatred, basically dripping from their mouths as well. And وَمَا تُخْفِي صُدُورُهُمْ أَكْبَرُ That which is in their heart is even that which they harbor in their heart. That rancor and hatred is even worse. قَدْ بَيَّنَّا لَكُمُ الْآيَاتِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ But this is, people have not been comprehending this. We've made these signs very clear to you so that you can comprehend and understand. And this discussion will continue to the end of the surah. So first there's a mini discussion of the battle of Badr. That's then followed by the battle of Uhud. 
And that's a huge discussion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Battle of Badr because there was a huge, that was the first battle in Islam, you could say. Right? The first time that they had to take up arms and basically fight the enemy. This is the first time that they had to do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it because the Ghazwa to Badr, the Battle of Badr is considered to be the crown of all the battles. It was the first one. It, it was a huge boost of energy and of courage for the Muslims because they were a few in the face of about three times their, uh, three times their number and they won. And it's the first time ever. And they were ill-equipped. The other side was much better equipped. So it, the morale was amazing. So what happens here is whoever is... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he was assisted during that time, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted them with 3,000 angels that came down. Then another one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can assist you with 5,000 angels that will come down. And subhanAllah, that, that was an amazing battle. I mean, this is not the time to go into the whole story of the battle. But that is really something that you need to go and check a seerah book, whether that be, you know, uh, Seerat Mustafa of Mala Idris Khan Dilwi, even Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Martin Lings is very good. There are a few problematic places in there, but otherwise it's one of really well-written book. So I would suggest you really, in your life, read at least a few, every few years, at least read one biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there's also the Prophet of Mercy that was published by Torah. That's a very good book as well. There's lots of them and you should read a book on Seerah. So there's a lot of unseen assistance that was provided in this battle from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and also the valor and the boldness shown by the Sahaba, the small group of Sahaba, mashallah. That's uh, huge. These are the following, these are the following uh, lessons that we learn from this. That number one, the conquest, uh, or you can say the winning and um, uh, winning in a battle and overcoming your enemy is not always about how much you have or how, ma how many weapons that you have or how much individual strength that you have or equipment that you have. Right? This actually shows that one of the biggest conditions uh, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is He wants to see your faith, your yaqeen, your steadfastness and doing things in the right way. Right? Number two, when people, when Muslims are steadfast and they hold fast onto, uh, to the rope of Allah and they stay together, then there's nothing that can overcome them. As I said, if you look at history, most of the time our defeat is because of being split up or being traded by your own people. Now, um, as I said, Ghazwa to Badr is only mentioned in the passing, really, right? Uh, all of this starts from Wa'id Ghadawta min ahlika tubawi ul mu'minina maqa'id al qital wallahu samiyun alim verse 121, and it carries on. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just reiterates the point of do not consume interest again, that's mentioned again, right? And fear, fear the hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about the battle of Uhud. Now the battle of Uhud is a lot more complicated because initial, initially there was success, right? There was success and then unfortunately it turned around and they could have been totally wiped out had it not been for some mistakes that the, were made basically by the disbelievers of Quraysh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allowing them to do that. So that's what we're going to look at. There's about 55 verses now that discuss the battle of Uhud. And there's huge lessons to be understood from the battle of Uhud. Because as I said, initially, there was success. And then after that, there was almost like a defeat until it became like a half-half situation. So in here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides warning. Allah provides understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides criticism, right? Critiques some of the mistakes that were made. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then praises as well. Where there's things to be praised, Allah praises that. And anybody who's read this story about the battle of Uhud, right? And again, if you don't, you need to get a book on seerah, right? So they, they will know about the various different complications and the turns in the battle that took place then. So initially, um, what happened is, after the about 70 of the leaders of the Quraysh, you know, though a lot of them that were plotting against Islam, because remember, this happened 
after the Prophet moved to Medina Munawwara. So after having suffered 13 years of persecution in Medina Munawwara, in Makkah Mukarramah, moved to Medina Munawwara, and now these people, there's a battle with these people. And in that battle, 70 of the huge leaders of the Quraysh were killed. That was massive. Like that was a, such a morale boost. That means they were left with, that means others had to take on their position. That's when Abu Sufyan became a leader because all the old guard had gone. Now that was a major setback, right? Huge setback. So they got together and they decided that they're going to attack Medina Munawwara. That's why the Battle of Uhud took place. They summoned, summoned up their forces. They had a huge amount of force and they came to try to get their revenge. And this happened in Shawwal of the third Hijri. And this was done under the leadership and the commandership of Abu Sufyan, who later, later becomes Muslim. But he's also a father-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right before he becomes a Muslim. His daughter is married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So anyway, they come and they attack Medina Munawwara. They were 3,000 strong. They were 3,000 strong. They had 200 horsemen, cavalry. They had 700 that were full of armor, like armored personnel, 700 of them. 3,000 camels they brought with them, that shows you supplies generally, right? Supplies, because you need supplies in a war, right? No planes in those days. And they brought along with them 500 women to help. So when, when you take out your women as well in a battle in those days, that means you really mean business. So 500 women came along, along with them was the Hinda story. Anyway, in front of these to basically confront them among the Muslim, there were only about 700. 700 compared to these 3,000 with all of this equipment. And what had happened is that the Prophet ﷺ in this battle shows his master planning as the commander par excellence, along with being the Prophet ﷺ and everything. So this is, when you go for Umrah or Hajj, you're generally going and given a tour of this. This is in Uhud, which is just a few miles from Masjid al-Nabawi. Right, there's the mounts there, there's several mounts, like hills and mounts, and there's a small one called Jabal al-Rumat. It became Jabal al-Rumat afterwards, I don't know if it was always called that name. Basically the mountain of the archers. That's in a very strategic position. Anybody who guards that, that, uh, mount, uh, that, that small hill, then they have basically protected any attack from one side. Then they only have to focus on the other side. Now remember, with everything that's happening, and all of the equipment that the people of Makkah have, the Prophet ﷺ shows his mastership here that he, he set everybody up in these small forces around and then these 50 archers uh, on this place, right? In a way that it dispersed the enemy forces. They were not able to use their cavalrymen as much and they had to actually fight on foot, it seems. So they were dispersed in that sense. The Prophet ﷺ told... It was Abdullah ibn Jubair radiallahu anhu. He gave him 50, it was 50 archers. Abdullah ibn Jubair was the, the leader. And he said, you must not move from here. Come what may. It doesn't matter, basically, he said, even if you've got, um, it doesn't matter if we get defeated, even if scavengers are coming and basically picking up from the bodies and you know, basically consuming the bodies of the, of the, of the martyrs, you must stay there. It's very important. Now, that was a, it carries on, and because of the spread, and because of the way they were dispersed, uh, the cavalry of the Meccans, they were unable to attack properly. And mashallah, in this battle, the Quraysh suffered a huge defeat. Initially, a huge defeat. After the 17 Badr, now they've got eight of their huge commanders or very important people were killed in this. And because of that, they, their morale just went down and they started to run away. That's the main force. Now, until now, the Jabal Rumat was fine. But now when they started running away and all of the loot, all the spoils they left behind because you, you're worried about your life now because you're going to be killed. So they, they left. In a battle, morale is very important. Like if you think I can do this or you think we're winning, makes it, that's why there's a lot of talk. Right? There's a lot of hype, right? morale boosters in that. But when they lost, they just went because they're big people. They le lo left a lot of their equipment. So now, mashallah, this is, uh, people ran towards it. The Muslims ran towards it. Now from this Jabal Rumat, from this little hill, 
uh, they saw the same thing. I think we've won. Clear win, clear, clear defeat. So many of them ran down until Abdullah ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu was actually just left there with about 10 mujahideen. 10 of the sahaba were left there. Now this is where Khalid bin Walid is on the other side right now. He's not a Muslim yet, but he's a, an amazing commander. He's not with the big, with the, with the major body of the fighters. He's on the side and he sees this. He sees this weakness opening. So remember now the Muslims are here in between and the others are retreating in that direction and you've got this area. So they come here surreptitiously in a surprise attack. They basically finish these people off the 10 that were left there and they run down and subhanallah, they start attacking the Muslims. And when you've got a surprise attack after letting down your guards, that's, that's one of the worst things that you can confront. So when the others on the other side now who are retreating, when they discovered this, when somebody informed them that, oh, you know, there's another chance right now, they've been, the Muslims have been attacked, they also doubled up and came back. So now the Muslims are sandwiched in between. So now what happens is you get quite a few Muslims that also uh, are martyred in this. So now we've got martyrs among the Muslimin. So while there were only 22 mushrikeen that were then killed after that, there were approximately 70 sahaba that became shaheed and martyred in this battle. And among them was the Sayyid al-Shuhada, the master of all martyrs, which was Hamza radiallahu an, the youngest uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the younger uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, despite the fact that if they continued the attack, they could have probably finished everybody off. This is what the historians say. But for some reason, and this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know when you've got this surprise victory, like you've taken what you think and you, okay, I've done enough, let's get back now. Abu Sufyan, they left. Right? So they did a bit of damage and then they left. Alhamdulillah. So now 55 verses are a discussion about the entire lessons and feedback, criticism, praise, and certain emotional uh, benefits from this and so on. All of that is discussed here. Now among this discussion, very prominent discussion is the munafiqeen. The hypocrites. Now they are obviously on the other side. They want to see the Muslims being defeated. So every time that they could basically spread rumors, cause some kind of facade and corruption in the, you know, and cause some kind of chaos, they would do that. So after the Prophet ﷺ buried the shuhada, all those who had been martyred, after the Prophet ﷺ, they buried them. They then heard that Abu Sufyan who left thinking that they'd won, He'd gotten to a place a few miles down called Roha, right? A place called Roha. He got to Roha, and that's when he realized that, man, what, what, what mistake we've made. We've run off too quickly, right? We've retreated too quickly. We could just go in and finish the job once and for all. There's no need for us to, you know, why didn't we do that? So then he's coming back. He decides to come back. And the Prophet Sallallahu hears about this. And in these days, I mean, these, this news would spread somehow, right? You know, you might have some people coming and telling you. So the Prophet Sallallahu finds out that the Quraysh want to come back. And if they come back, this is going to be very difficult. So the Prophet Sallallahu now makes an announcement that we are going to chase them. We're going to go after them to, to meet them. And the only people that can come with me today are those people who were with me yesterday. Those people who fought yesterday, only they can be with me. Now you have to remember, this, there's two parts to this, right? Number one, these people are tired, right? Wounded. They've had a, you know, battle takes everything out of you. Right? Just try getting into a boxing ring for 30 seconds and you'll see how, right? And when you've got a whole battle for a day or two, you can understand. But these are the people who had the iman, the yaqeen, who proved it. So only they were allowed to come. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ announced that, they got ready to go with him. And they, go, they, they got ready to go with him, despite all of their problems, all of their wounds and everything like that. And this is about eight miles from Medina Munawwara, right? Where there's a place called Hamra ul Asad, the, the red of the, the, the lion. Not sure exactly why that name is, Hamra ul Asad. It's called Hamra, maybe the stones are red there or something. But that's a place about eight miles from Medina Munawwara. When they got there, now the mushrikeen of Makkah, they discovered that the Muslims are coming out. Now they'd already, they were already scared. They thought that they'd been lucky and they were going to come back and take them unawares. But when they discovered that the Prophet ﷺ is out there again, right? 
to, to basically give them a fight. Then they decided against it. And they decided it was just best to go back. That's why this small expedition is counted separately, although it's kind of linked to the whole battle of Badr, uh, Uhud. It's actually called Ghazwatu uh, Hamra al Asad, the Hamra al Asad expedition. So that's why you'll see this mentioned separately in places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a huge, huge amount of promise and uh, Allah congratulates the people who basically were with the Prophet in this regard. That's where you have in verse 172, that's where all of this is discussed. Allahu Akbar Farihina bima atahumullahu min fadli, wa yastab shiruna bil ladina lam yalhaku bihim min khalfihim, Allah khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun, yastab shiruna bi ni'matim min Allahi wa fadl, wa anna Allah la yudi'u ajra al mu'minin, al ladina stajabu lillahi wa rasul, min badi ma asabahum al karh. This is verse 172, that those people who responded to the Allah and His Messenger after they had been wounded, those who do good among them, and who have taqwa, for them is a huge reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them, قَالَ لَهُمْ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا People were trying to mislead them and to weaken them by saying that, look, people have been gathered for you, you're going to be defeated. But no, that just increased them in iman because Allah had told them that you're going to suffer. There is going to be suffering you'll have to deal with. And they said, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ This is that amazing Dua of Allah, which is one of the most uh, du'as of the Qur'an, which is one of the most powerful du'as whenever you're in any kind of helpless state, any kind of despondency, read Hasbun Allah. Allah is sufficient for us and He's the best patron. You're remembering Allah with that. You're saying, oh Allah, everything is to you now. That's that فَانْقَلَبُوا بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ Allah. So now these people returned and came back with bounty from Allah وَفَضْل and all grace لَمْ يَمْسَسْهُمْ سُوء وَاتَّبَعُوا رِدْوَانَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَظِيمٍ إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءِ Shaytan is going to give you fear. He's going to try to create fear. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ Allah says, only fear me. Don't fear shaytan or anybody else. And وَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ الَّذِينَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ Do not let those who try to instill disbelief among you almost. Right? Don't let them grieve you. Don't let, they cannot harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the least. Anyway, there's lots of warnings and censoring and all the rest of it. You can, inshallah, read that. I just want to point out a few other things in here before we get to the end of the surah. That don't worry if you, uh, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is also being told that don't worry if people have not believed in you and have denied you. Well, that happened to the prophets of the past. You never get a full acceptance among people. It, there's always going to be a difference. As Allah says in another place, if Allah wills, He could have made you all one ummah. He could have all put you on one platform. لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً wahida. Could have done that. But this is Allah's test that whoever wins, whoever does right, they get the right. They get. Then Allah, there's another important verse here. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Everybody's going to eventually die. If you die in a battle, or you die in a skirmish like this, or you die on your bed, you're eventually going to die. Death is the same. Except that if you do die as a shaheed, the enjoyment you'll get, the pleasure that you get, and people who see shuhada go, they feel a loss because they feel that somebody's gone, but the shaheed himself feels amazing. Unless the people, their family members who know that these people are going, if it's a correct understanding, then also they, they generally revel at the fact that they are. That's why among the sahaba you'll see, so I'm the mother of a shaheed, I'm the mother of a, uh, of a martyr. وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ You'll be given your full reward on the Day of Judgment. That is verse 185. The next part here is the verse, وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ This is verse 190. These are some of the verses that the Prophet used to think about and read when he used to wake up for tahajjud. You know when you wake up for tahajjud, if we get that opportunity, Allah give us that opportunity, especially in Ramadan. It's a time of great solitude. There's not much disturbance. You're probably not going to be receiving text messages unless you're on like a tahajjud group, right? That people have these tahajjud groups, mashallah, where they wake one another up, right? Hint, hint. Um, you know, you can, you can do that if you want. So you're not going to get mad. So that time you're thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, the inna fi khalqis samawati wal ard, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the movement of the night and day, 
لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ There's signs in here for the people with intellect and understanding. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَكُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Those who remember Allah standing, sitting and on their side. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And they ponder and reflect over the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then ultimately their, their, their confession is, their statement is, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا Our Lord, you've not created all of this in vain. Subhanak, فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ why is this discussion there? Glorified be you, protect us from the hellfire. What's protect us from the hellfire got to do with reflection of the universe? And that possibly is that there's a part of the universe which is very attractive to us that gets us in a lot of trouble. That basically takes us away and makes us punishable. So maybe that's the point there, that there's all of this. Let me see it in the right way and let me use it in the right way and do not let me do it in a way that I will be entitled to the punishment of the, of the fire. Then there's a number of du'as that I mentioned, Rabbana innaka man tudkhilin nara faqad akhzayta, and, and so on, which you can, inshallah, read in those next few verses. Um, to finish off the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about four advices. That last ayah of the surah, verse 200, right, gives a few advices after all of that, after speaking about the battle and everything. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sbiru. وَصَابِرُوا وَرَابِطُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ This is for everybody. O people who believe, exercise patience. Patience is the ingredient of life. Without patience, we won't survive. You have to have patience. Even to pray salat and to fast is an aspect of patience. Right? Perseverance. وَصَابِرُوا So, إِسْبِرُوا وَصَابِرُوا It's two different things that I mentioned here. Right? Sabr and musabara. Musabara is when you have to do sabr in the face of someone else, where you're forced, like in the face of your enemy, in the face of difficulty, in the face of an attack from Islamophobes, for example, sabiru, mutual, mutually assisting one another in that patience as well, because when one person is patient in the right way and they don't give up, it helps a lot of other people. Warabitu, rabitu means to prepare and to basically protect your borders, right? So in the West, that would be, you know, protect your, yourself from becoming uh, prey to various different types of attacks or, and uh, also to basically be equipped to deal with a lot of the Islamophobic uh, propaganda that's out there as well. Anyway, and the last point was, وَاتَّقُوا Have taqwa, fear Allah, so that you may gain success. تُفْلِحُون So that you may gain success. And the word falah, تُفْلِحُون As opposed to tafuzun. Right, foes. Falah means a success after which there's never, there's no failure. A closeness to Allah after which there's no distance. It's the ultimate success. That's qad aflah al mu'minun. That's falah. It's a very high level of success. Right, that finishes Surah Ali Imran. Now we move on to Surah Al Nisa, the chapter of Nisa, which is basically women. The chapter regarding women, because there are two chapters in the Quran that have focus discussion about rulings of women. One is this and the other one is Surah Al-Talaq. That one's called Surah Al-Talaq. This one is called Surah Al-Nisa. That's why some have actually called that one Surah Al-Nisa Sughra, the, the smaller Surah Al-Nisa. And this is the larger Surah Al-Nisa because it's got specific um, rulings relating to women. It's Again, it's a, it's a Madani Surah, right? Because it's going to have a lot of laws in there. It has a, a 176 verses. So you can see that it's actually now getting shorter compared to 200 of Surah Ali Imran. This one has 176 verses. The following are the main points that we're going to be covering in Surah An-Nisa. Number one, it's going to be discussing orphans. Right? An orphan is somebody who doesn't have a, who loses their father during, loses their father during their childhood, before maturity. Once you become mature, you're no longer considered an orphan, right? You've get, you get, get these people to come and beg, they're older men, will come and say, I'm an orphan, can you please help me? I'm an orphan from Kashmir. In Saudi, they do that a lot, in Hajj. So my dad said to one of them, well, you're not an orphan, orphans are children. It's only when you're a child that you don't have a father, right? But they have a mother, that's fine, they can have a mother. But generally, women are lumbered with this sometimes. That, that's a, a burden they have to deal with, right? They love them from the bottom of their hearts. So Allah makes it easy for them. But it's talking about the wealth of orphans. 
because there was a huge amount of manipulation and deception when it came to the wealth of orphans. So that's why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning against taking the wealth of orphan, orphans. So it's talking about two things relating to orphans. Then number three, it's talking about the permission of marrying up to four wives, right? For one man to marry up to four wives, but with the condition that you, you, you are, you are um, just, that you exercise justice among them and you be fair to them. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 3, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا If you're fearful that you will not be able to be justice. I mean, people should know that. Right? Like, am I a just person? They need to, that this is something they need to think about between them and Allah. And of course, a lot of people who do this wrong, they're not going to be very conscious about this kind of stuff. They're not going to be really true to themselves. And that's the problem. That's why we have problems in where, wherever multiple marriages sometimes take place. So, if you, if you, uh, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ If you are fearful that you will not be able to be just فَوَاحِدَةً Then just one or that which your right hand possesses. Right? Which basically refers to slave girls, which we no longer have uh, much of that in, in, in most parts of the world, as far as my understanding goes today. So that's the next discussion. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see, the reason for bringing this verse here was a few things. Number one, before Islam, they used to do multiple marriages. And in a very crude way, there was actually no number. You could do as many as you wanted in the time of Jahiliyyah. There was no concept of justice. You could literally leave one suspended, like she's still my wife, but she's not my wife anymore. I'm not going to fulfill any of her rights and just dump her basically, but not release her either. They used to actually inherit their father's wives, who were not their mothers, the other wives. They would actually inherit them. The father died, they would be inherited. It was real, real turmoil, real, real persecution, real oppression. So that's why Islam said, look, only four, maximum, and that with justice as well, and um, how to do it, and all the rest of it, all of that, you can't marry two sisters at once, and, and so on and so forth. They're not inheritance, and all the rest of it. Now the thing is that I don't want to go into the whole concept of polygamy. There's lots of discussions about that. We've discussed it several times uh, over as well before. But the main thing that you have to understand is that in Islam where this does happen, it needs to be done with responsibility. And that makes it the biggest change that generally the world over, especially in the West, uh, a person may have one wife or no wife at all, like official married wife, but then they could have several girlfriends, several people that they're just basically... Uh, staying together with or seeing once in a while or that Islam this is a, there's no casual relationship like that right you're allowed up to four in a proper way so you can see the contrast between that then after that we move on and then the huge discussion after after discussing about the yatim and so on and giving a lot of emotional emotional uh, encouragement there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then in great depth as I said if you look through the whole Quran you will not find the number of raka'at so you're for fajr or Dhuhr, or Asr, or Maghrib, or Isha, even though that is such the most important integral of Islam. But you will find in great depth the inheritance portions, the inheritance division. And that is, starts at this, وَإِذَا حَضَرَ الْقِسْمَةَ أُولُوا الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ See, because women were not given inheritance and children were not given inheritance. In fact, what they used to say in those days is that why give inheritance to someone who doesn't hold a sword, can't sit on a horse to fight, and doesn't confront the enemy, talking about women. It's just their way of looking at that. So Islam said, no, they must be given, right? They, they deserve it, and they must be given for themselves, not because they do anything or not do anything. This is a haq of Allah that you must give them their inheritance. So that's why the, uh, the, the discussion is there is about If you look at uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 11 uh, and verse 13 and so on If you look at verse 11 and discussing that if there are children Then the mother will still get one sixth And if there's no children, the mother gets one, uh, one third And so on and so forth All of the discussion is there very clearly Then husband and wife وَلَكُمْ نِسْفُ مَا تَرَكَ أَزْوَاجُكُمْ between the husband and wife, the husband passes away, what does the wife get? If they have children, the wife gets, uh, uh, the, the, the wife gets a quarter. Uh, if they have children, then they get one eighth. And if the husband, if the, husband uh, if the wife passes away, the husband gets a half if they have no children. And if they have children, then the husband gets a quarter. And so on, the whole discussion is there after any wasiyah and so on. 
Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses from verse, uh, for verse 15. This is the discussion about a lot of people when they say homosexuality is mentioned in the Quran, they refer to the story of Lut alayhi salam. And in that one, then they, what they do is they actually interpret that in other meanings to try to diffuse the whole problem, right? That diffuse the whole blameworthiness of it. And I've seen a lot of writings, they actually miss this verse. This verse is actually much more explicit about the punishment. It's not explicit as to the type of punishment, but there is a discussion about the blameworthiness of it, about women doing this and then men doing this, right? So you can look at the tafsir of that. This is verse uh, 15 and verse 16. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about tawbah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's philosophy of repentance, right? The Muslim philosophy of repentance is that the tawbah is for those who end up doing something wrong out of ignorance, overlap, uh, um, a mistake, right? Becoming overcome. And then after that, very soon they make tawbah, they repent. Then Allah will, Allah will accept their repentance because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing and the wise. وَلَيْسَ لِلْتَوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ The tawbah repentance is not for those who do evil deeds. And then they wait until they're about to die. And then they're saying, I am making tawbah right now. When they actually start seeing reality, mortality, clearly. Right? It says, that is not the time. Or the people who die as disbelievers. Right? Uh, that, uh, the tawbah is not for them. Uh, as we've read before as well, that Allah forgives every sin except Kufr and shirk. Finally, the last discussion then goes back to marriage. Because this is to do with men, so what, what, uh, who is marriage allowed with and who it's not allowed with. And that's why the final verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 23, which is the final verse, is حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ So prohibited for you are your mothers. Your daughters, your sisters, your maternal and paternal aunts, uh, your nieces uh, from both sides. And then it goes into your milk mothers, those who fed you milk. And your milk sisters, the daughter of the woman who fed you, who nursed you. And then it talks about uh, through marriage, right? Through in-laws, what becomes haram in that sense. Very detailed again. And that actually, while it says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمًا that discussion actually continues through the next verse, which is the first verse of the fifth juz. Wal muhsanatu min an nisa. That's why generally when I read to the end of the fifth, uh, the fourth juz, I carry on and read the first verse of the fifth juz because actually the theme is the same. It's the same continuation. Right. That is. So the last verse here is wa antajma'u bain illa ma qas inna Allah kana ghafura rahima. Allah subhanahu wa taala is all forgiving and all merciful. So now to finish off, let us just. Round it off with our several points. I've got quite a few points to round it off today. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the chapter. Uh, be, the, the, the chapter, fourth chapter begins with the discussion about the Baytullah and how it's the first house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is linked to the one travel obligation in Islam. Number two, encouragement to hold fast, fast to the, the rope of Allah which means everybody get together and follow the deen in a way that's unified and do not disperse wala tatafarraqu otherwise you'll be weakened then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this whole discussion about being the best ummah because of the concept of amal ma'ruf and al munkar inshallah from now on let us see what little bit we can do in that regard little encouragement so that at least there's some goodness that's been spread and uh, we're stopping evil even in a small amount as best as we can inshallah that is one of the khasais and particular exclusive factors of this ummah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, speaks about the harm of taking your enemies as your close confidants or associates and so on. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts from verse 121, the discussion of the battle of Badr and then Uhud. And then in the midst of that, puts down riba again and focusing too much on the dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this about the believers. Right, I, did, uh, I left it till the end. It's verse 133 to 138. Hasten towards the forgiveness from your Lord and the gardens whose width and whose scope is the heavens and the earth which has been prepared for the believers. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions some other things. And then at the end of it, he says, هذا بيان للناس وهدى وموعظة للمتقين That this is clarity, providing clarity for the people. This is a guidance and this is also the nasiha and the counsel for those who act with righteousness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do that. Then in verse 139, Allah tells us very importantly, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ do not become weak. Do not basically lose the ground from under you, right? That you just feel at loss and you're grieving in a state of anxiety because you will remain elevated if you are true believers. And I want to just use this time that there's one country, this happens many places, but there's one country in the world where somebody did a really, a Muslim, right? Did a, one of those terrorism acts. Because of that, had a really bad backfiring upon the community there to such a degree that apparently many women who saw a niqab they have taken it off because the fear factor that's been created and it seems like the leaders there may Allah give them strength they, they've not found a way to give people back their, their yaqeen so I've spoken to a few individuals there and it's, it's bad and this is a verse that they should we should think about in any case I mean this doesn't have to be for that country it could be anywhere wherever you suffer a setback Right? And this happens, Allah protects. Every few, several months or something, some idiot goes and does, some foolish guy goes and does something bad. Right? In the name of Islam, so then all gaze is turned to us. And this is important, that just because of that, it doesn't mean that you take off your beards, that you take off your hijabs, you change your names from Aslam to Sam, right? and, and so on and so forth. That is the time when you need to stand your ground, because as soon as you try to just acquiesce, then there'll be more acquiescence, there'll be more of that happening. You'll have to go further and further down. The only way is to resist and do the right thing. Right? To do the right thing of Islam, and in, you will always remain high if you do the right thing. The narrative has to be proper though, that's important. Then, uh, what we could call the khawatim of Surah Ali Imran. Because we had the khawatim of Surah Al-Baqarah, Aman al Rasul are called the end verses. The sealing verses rather, right? Sealing verses. So the sealing verses of Surah Ali Imran, uh, in this case here now, uh, surah, uh, we had Surah Al-Baqarah sealing verses. Now we have Surah Ali Imran, Inna fi khalqis samawati, which I pointed out to you. That is verse 190. Until the end of Surah, all of that is reflection. Right? Those are very, if you ever want to sit down and just reflect, you want something to reflect on, take verse 190 till the end of Surah Ali Imran and just ponder over it. As I said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to take some of those verses at tahajjud time and do it. Pick up a Quran and do that today if, if possible. And Surah An-Nisa now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously starts this with talking about the rights of the oppressed and the weak. Right? Like for example, the orphans, the women, those who are considered to be weakened and looked down upon the earth, right? who cannot do hijrah, Allah discusses that as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then discusses in detail the inheritance, uh, inheritance shares in great detail. Subhanallah. And uh, Allah emphasizes that women should be given their irth. They should be given, I mean, until recently, uh, even in some cases now in places like India and Pakistan, I can't speak about other countries, but even places like India and Pakistan, women were not given their share. Because they thought like, they're, they're out of our family, they've gone, they're going to get from their husbands, right, from another family, right? So we don't have to give them. It's just this bad cultural idea. Alhamdulillah, things have changed quite a bit. Right? And if that's going on in your family and your parents have not, your parents, uh, your father, um, you know, did not give his sister, then you need to, uh, if your father's gone and they can't make amends, then maybe you can maybe do a bit of writing to, the, uh, you know, uh, to sort that situation out. Anyway, so that's an encouragement there. And then the, the final discussion basically is, as we just mentioned, the, those which are prohibited to marry. And you can, Allah says, you can marry Beyond that, you can marry whoever you want, as long as it's not one of these categories. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, again, allowing to, us to uh, complete this in the appointed time. And we ask Allah to infuse our hearts with the blessing of the Qur'an, the light of the Qur'an, make it a source of illumination for our lives and a removal of our anxieties and our cares and problems and make it something that we can ascend in Jannatul Firdaus and Allah be happy with us. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.